Hi, I'm Slow51. Today's... Today, I'd like to talk about some of the games I've worked on in the past. I'm going to use this storyboard to point out some of the stuff that I've done and some of the stuff I've worked on. So, everybody, check it out. Before getting into the game industry, I actually worked for a funeral parlor. I'm not very good at drawing, so sorry about that. I'd drive around in this sort of compact truck with all the different funeral supplies and stuff in the back. Originally, I was considering going into the funeral parlor business full-time as a career. But at the time, my wife came to me and said, is this really what you want to do? So this is kind of what my wife looked like at the time. Maybe something like that. Whatever. So when I was thinking about, okay, well, what exactly is it that I want to do then? I remember that just a little bit before that, I had done a job for Sega. This one day when I was at Sega, there was a designer named Suzuki Yu who came up to me and said, hey, I'd like you to actually play virtual racing for me and design it while you're playing and see what you can do. One thing that surprised me was when I went into the development offices, there was all these people sitting at desks, playing games, listening to music on earphones, and they were all really young. They were around my age. And I'm looking at the different CDs they're listening to, and they're listening to the same music that I like. And it really kind of blew me away, because up until that point, I had this image of all the people who were making games were sort of these, like, scientist or professor-looking people with white smocks and basically a sort of cartoon mad scientist vibe. But yeah, I saw that there were people my age doing the same kind of stuff that I did. So from that point on, I took an interest in the game industry and thought, wow, it'd be really cool if I could work in not just this place in particular, but just somewhere in the industry. I went home and I got a job seeking magazine and my wife offered a lot of support. So I looked through it to see if there was anything I could do that was related to games. I found a place called Human and a place called Atlas that were looking for employees. So I went for interviews with Human and Atlas, but was immediately turned away from Atlas. I got the job at Human. Then I went back for an interview to Human and ended up being turned away. For a month, I didn't get any contact from them or anything. So I figured, okay, in that case, I'm just going to go back to the funeral parlor thing and kind of give up on this. But my wife told me, why don't you just try and call them and see what's going on? I tried calling them to see if there was something we could work out. So when I called them up, they told me that the director for the game Fire Pro, which actually ended up becoming my debut game, that he quit all of a sudden. And so they didn't have anyone there who could write or really do anything with pro wrestling. So they asked me, sorry, but could you come back in right away for another interview? So I went back for another interview and they hired me immediately. And that's how I joined the company, Human. Basically, this is how I entered the games industry. It's been so long since I've seen any of this text. I'm reading through it and I'm thinking, wow, I don't remember writing any of this. Some of it's actually kind of embarrassing, to be honest. It sort of feels like I'm reading something that a completely different person wrote a long time ago. A whiteout. Is this how it ended? I forgot. Oh, this is what happens. This is the main character. The name Smith Morio actually came from the Smiths and Morrissey. I just really like the Smiths, so I, I ripped off the name for the character. <laughs> So right around here where the arrow's pointing, just inside there, Smith had just committed suicide. You probably can't hear the sound here, but this is Smith's house, and you can hear the sound of a gunshot. So I actually made two endings for the game. One ending in which you win the match, and one ending in which you lose the match. Obviously, if you win the match, that was the happy ending. Lose the match, that's the bad ending. We had the endings implemented, and during the debug and checking phase, I tried playing through it, and it just kind of felt weird and off to me. And I thought it didn't make any sense that this guy's life would have two completely separate possibilities for the rest of his life based on whether or not he won the match. 
So I went to the programmers and I told them, look, I changed my mind. Just get rid of one of these endings. I just wanted to have one conclusive ending. As for the reaction to the ending, it was really kind of a big deal at the time. Back then, the internet wasn't necessarily as prevalent as it is now. In Japan, we had this forum called Nifty, where people would communicate with each other really simply online. But most of the communication and contact we'd get from fans and users were in the form of postcards. And when we'd get postcards about the Fire Pro games, it would be like, hey, I want you to put this wrestler in the game, or hey, I want to see this move in the next game. Mainly stuff like that, with people saying, hey, love the game, didn't like the game, or whatever. But once we put the game out and people saw the ending, we started getting these huge cardboard boxes just filled with postcards and almost none of them were nice, fuzzy, happy messages. Most of them were saying stuff like, what the hell did you do with that ending? What's wrong with you? F*** you. Die. People were really kind of upset about what we did and it really blew up. I was a bit surprised, but at the same time, what are you going to do really? It really was a huge deal for myself and for the company for a while afterward. Today is the last day of GDC and I can finally talk about this, as it was just announced this morning. I'm coming back to the Fire Pro series for the first time in 25 years. The upcoming scenario I'm writing is called Champion Road 2. And this time the main character is the son of the original main character, Smith Morio. The son's name is Blade Saiba. It's a direct sequel to the well-known traumatic scenario called Champion Road from 25 years ago. Again, it's my first time coming back to the series in 25 years, and I'm really looking forward to it. Let's see what we can do. When I was working on the Fire Pro games, I was working really late every day, basically from first thing in the morning until last train at night, so usually past midnight. And every day between 6 and 7 o'clock in the evening, everyone else would go out for dinner. But I wasn't really eating dinner that much, and so I'd basically take a nap at my desk, put my headphones on and put my head down. The song I would almost always listen to during these naps was this song called Grasshopper by a UK band called Ride. When I started up the new company, I decided to go with the name Grasshopper so I wouldn't forget what it was like to be creating my first game. Looking through this opening, there's all kinds of stuff that's really kind of flooding back to memory. A lot of it's really nostalgic. One thing that really kind of stands out is nowadays people have smartphones and PCs. Technology has really kind of become easier to get your hands on, so pretty much anyone can take a video and edit it, add effects and things like that. But at the time, that wasn't the case. When we made this opening, we had to take a proper TV-style camera around the city and film a bunch of stuff, and then bring that into a studio and have it all edited. Today, it could be done a lot easier, but at the time, it took a lot of work. This part right here is Akihabara in Tokyo. Even making this opening here, I had to go into the studio in Akasaka for days and days doing the direction for it, the tiny tweaks and adjustments, and helping out with the editing. It's really nostalgic. Even just these little things here with the images kind of moving in from the side and sliding across the screen, I was standing right there with the editor giving really finely detailed directions. And it just turned out that the guy really didn't listen to me very much. At the time, a lot of people still didn't think very highly of video games, and so when I'm sitting here with this guy telling him, okay, put this image here, he would kind of give me a lot of backtalk, like, why do I have to edit this? It's just a goddamn game. What am I doing here? And I would tell him, look, this is just what I want to make, so please make it the way that I'm asking you. He really didn't like what he was doing, so it was a real hassle getting this done properly. More than 14. This is really nostalgic. This is the old version. As far as Killer7 goes, it's chock full of memories with Mikami at the time. When we made the prototype, I think I redid the entire first stage probably 10 or so times. The process was I'd put the stage together, go to Mikami maybe about once a month, and show him what we had. And he'd tell me, okay, maybe change this to make it more this way or, or get rid of this. Then we'd go back and remake it again. 
This part two, actually. I, I don't believe this is how it ended up looking in the final game. The crosshairs, the, the style of crosshairs is a bit different here. But that's just a small detail I happen to notice. With Killer7, I was just constantly concentrating on it. It really was like work, and so I decided with No More Heroes, I wanted to go in a different direction. And I wanted to make sure that I had fun making the game, and wasn't just working myself to death. And so what I decided to do was to take all the stuff that I wanted to put in the game, and put it in there and just get it all out. I guess you could say it's kind of like taking a shit on the toilet. I just sat there and got everything out the way I wanted, and it felt great. No More Heroes is the game from which the character Travis Touchdown was born. In a way, I was going in the opposite direction than I had went with Killer7. Travis, and by extension of the game itself, was conceived because at the time I was really into Jackass and thought Johnny Knoxville was really awesome. Watching Johnny Knoxville, I thought he was funny and stupid and he didn't care, but in a good way. One day I thought, what if Johnny Knoxville was like a real Star Wars super fan otaku type guy? And what if he got his hands on a lightsaber and went crazy? And from that idea, the entire game and character was born. So I did run into a bit of trouble with this when I was pitching the game. I said, okay, I want to base this character off this guy, Johnny Knoxville. So I brought in some footage of Jackass to show the rest of the team and said, this is Johnny Knoxville. This is the guy I want to base this character on. And the footage they saw was Johnny Knoxville standing there naked with little baby alligators clamped onto his nipples. And the whole room kind of just went silent and there was a real vibe of what the hell is wrong with you at the time. Every time I watched the clip, I laughed my ass off. But when I showed that clip, all the rest of the staff just got totally silent and just kind of stared like, what is going on here? So Travis was born from that sort of problem. <laughs> Here's the beam katana, and, and this was not inspired by Star Wars. That's what I've been telling people for years, for safety. It was inspired by Uchu Keiji Gaban, which is something like Space Detective Gaban, which is a Japanese show from way back in the day. Again, that's what I've been telling everyone for years, just to be safe. Actually, it definitely wasn't Star Wars, but it could have been Spaceballs. So that could have been where I got the inspiration from. But it wasn't Star Wars. So no problem whatsoever. Yeah. We ended up making Shadows of the Damned with EA. And again, this was another title on which I worked with Mikami for the first time in a while. Once again, as producer and director. I've got a lot of memories of the development of this game with EA, but, but one of the things that sticks out in my mind the most is, I guess you could say, the battle with the words Western market throughout the entirety of it. I think there was about three or so characters that we burned through before we ended up landing on Garcia. So Garcia was probably about the fourth character we considered. We rehauled and redid the script about five times, and the fifth version is what ended up becoming Shadows of the Damned. So each time I rewrote the script, we'd have to redo the character, because that's just sort of a habit of mine. And so the way the character looks ends up changing as well. So each time I'd have to rewrite the character, I rewrite the script, which would mean the character would have to be redesigned. Also, EA kept telling me over and over, fix this, redo this. If I ever happened to work with EA on another game, I'd really appreciate if they would just okay the first version of the script next time. Hey. <laughs> Thorax! I performed a, a magical ritual on your head. I originally went to the States with Kadokawa to speak to a bunch of different publishers about the game we were about to create. And when we went to Warner Brothers, they said, hey, we've got this director named James Gunn. What would you think about having him join the team and maybe help out with the game? I'd seen some of his movies before, and so I was like, yeah, totally, let's bring this guy on. And that's basically how James Gunn came to be involved. I'm James Gunn, I'm a filmmaker. I was brought in to help craft the story of Olipop Chainsaw and deal with the actors. 
And after that, he really kind of blew up with the Guardians of the Galaxy series. And when he came to Japan to promote the movie, we'd go out to get a bite to eat together. And he even sent me an invitation to the premiere of the second movie. We still talk, even now, and yeah, our relationship is still going on. I'd like to think that I could call him a great friend. He's just a good guy. And I'm really happy to have had the opportunity to work with him. And I hope that someday we'll be able to make a game together again. I'm not sure if it's okay for me to say this, but I'm really happy that James is coming back for Guardians 3. As far as things I learned about myself, something I noticed was originally I entered the industry as an idea man, having ideas for the pro wrestling games I worked on. One thing I noticed is that I really, really love the process of coming up with these ideas for games from the ground up, building everything up from scratch. I'd been kind of worried over the years as I got older. Am I going to stop having these ideas? Am I going to start having trouble coming up with new stuff to do? But I found that's actually not the case. In fact, as I grow along with the industry, you've got new consoles, new technology. Google just made a really big announcement the other day. I start having ideas that sort of fit with the way the industry has changed and technology has changed. Even today, I still really love just coming up with ideas for games. I'm not sure if that's something you could say I learned about myself, but definitely something I noticed is that I'm surely doing the job that I'm meant to be doing, which is coming up with these ideas for these games, seeing what we can do with these ideas, to sort of push the boundaries of the technology we have to work with. One other thing I learned about myself is I just really suck at English. I've been coming overseas here to America and all over the place for years, so many times. I speak with so many people, I come into contact with English so many times, but I just can't seem to learn it. It just completely escapes me. And there's probably a lot of people out there who are going to be like, Suda, come on, man, learn English, dude. But it's just not going to happen.